people get so well and it just changes their life. Um, and it, it makes me just really sad to see people essentially sleepwalking to a later life of sickness and, and pain and, and potential surgeries and potentially a shorter life, not knowing what they don't know. Um, so it really is powerful helping spread this, this message that people can, can take, take control of their health and not have to suffer with the burden of chronic disease and obesity. everyone, welcome back to Creating a Vegan World. My name is Andrew Alexander, and today we have a very special guest. It's Dr. Peter Johnston, and he is helping shift the healthcare system to be a more effective one, where a lot of times people end up in the hospitals, they end up sick based on diet and lifestyle choices. So him and his organizations are creating programs that help prevent this from happening in the first place. So it reduces healthcare costs overall, less people get sick, and I really think it's the future of medicine. And it's really great to have you on here. So uh, thanks, Andrew. A, a privilege to be on your YouTube channel and thank you for reaching out to me. Definitely. So if we want to start, we just want to go into what is the problem we see in the world, especially with the healthcare system? What do you see all the problems going on with there? If you want to talk about that? Sure. Um, well, the healthcare system evolved at a time when chronic disease was a lot less prevalent. In fact, pretty uncommon amongst most ordinary working people. The things that, that took people to hospital or to doctors back then were infectious diseases and, and trauma, accidents, you know, breaking legs and things like that. But as our affluence has increased, so has the caloric density of our diet and our lifestyles have worsened. And so it's estimated that around 80% of people in hospitals today in the modern world are there because of lifestyle, um, what they put in their mouth, what they do with their feet, um, whether they smoke or, or take substances. Um, and th those are avoidable conditions. Those people shouldn't be in hospital in an ideal world if they were, if they were aware and helped and to live a more healthy life um, and in a world which is more conducive to good health. What we live in today is, is been termed an obesogenic environment. So it's pretty much all geared to, to make people overweight and unwell. Um, and that's not a conspiracy. It's just, it's just business. There's more profit to be had in people buying rich, hyper-processed foods. For example, there's a lot more profit in selling a pack of Pringles than there is in potatoes. Um, fruit and vegetables are perishable, they don't travel well, they don't store well, they're not addictive or hyper stimulating, people don't crave them or binge on them, but they're the essence of good health. Um, but manufacturers in the name of business are looking for products that people will buy and buy again and again. And they're using salt, fat, sugar, amongst other things, to make those foods addictive and craveable. And those rich, rich um, foods are everywhere we turn from filling up with your car with gas, um, you're surrounded by chocolate bars, potato chips, Slurpees, donuts, hot dogs, soft drinks, you name it, um, to any cafe, the cabinets are full of rich, attractive looking slices and sorbets and ham and cheese croissant and the like. And any shopping center, the supermarkets are full of foods, 90% of which I wouldn't eat or don't recommend. Too processed, you know, they've had junk added, the fat, salt and sugar, preservatives, stabilizers, emulsifiers, flavorings, anti-foaming agents, you name it. And they've had good stuff taken out like fiber and water. Um, so aside from the produce section, you know, even the supermarket is a hazardous place. So everywhere we turn, the environment is, is set up to make us fail. And, and it's, it's not 
the fault of any one person. We, we actually, we're actually wired to want these high energy density foods. Um, we get a dopamine hit when we have rich foods. Um, these, this, this is what helped us survive through 99% of our evolution before we had farming and domesticated animals when we were small tribes foraging for our food and didn't know where our next meal was coming from. The biggest threats to us in those times were being someone else's food, um, being caught by a tiger, for example, or not having enough food. Um, if spring was late or there was a drought or there wasn't you know, the other animals got the food before us, um, then we could, we could go hungry for quite a time. So we, we evolved this, this, this mechanism to give us a pleasure a hit when, through dopamine when we have rich foods. It's the same for reproduction. We, we get pleasure from having sex for the same reason. It, it helps ensure the survival of the species. So I, I tell my patients, there's nothing wrong with them if they are craving and wanting to eat these, you know, rich processed and ultra processed foods, it, they're doing exactly as programmed. It's, um, it just makes it very hard to survive in this world. Um, people need really good habits. They need good discipline. They need to have a healthy home environment. Um, it takes some real determination not to slide back, back into what, what's been described as a as a pleasure trap environment. Yeah, I think the first step is awareness where even like myself, I'm aware of these things, but at the same time, if I see chips, like they're just, I'm like craving it, like the deeper driver, despite my willpower wanting healthier. So that's the hard part. And I think even before that, not even being aware of it, because when I grew up outside of New York City, it's like you go to the supermarket, there's the shelves and like you just, there's so much stuff put into the food, there's additives that, we don't even realize it and it takes the awareness then the willpower then the know-how to do that and then i think i was talking before you said that like 80 percent of people more or less end up in the hospital system because of this so what other like system-wide i guess downfalls are there i know in the u.s there's the healthcare premium costs where i think it's on average i was paying like 300 385 dollars per month just for the health insurance premium whereas i'm sure in australia it's like recycled into tax money. Is there other like side effects at the society level that um, you see from this? Well, the US so-called healthcare system, I, I would call our modern healthcare systems actually sickness care systems. And I can explain that later, but the US system is much more privatized than anywhere else in the, in the Western world um, and is the most expensive system in the world. It's, it's approaching 20% of GDP. And with this tsunami of obesity and chronic disease, it's likely to bankrupt the US. Um, the health, health insurance companies in the US and here have a direct stake in wanting people to be more healthy. And they are making some efforts in that area. But on the other hand, in the US where you have privately run hospitals, they have an incentive to have more customers. And so, actually don't want people to be more healthy. And that's, that's actually another insidious part about the current system and status quo in that a lot of people are making a lot of money from things as they are with people getting overweight and unwell. The pharmaceutical industries, um, the processed food industries, medical specialists who do procedures, um, food menu, a lot of restaurants and food manufacturers so there's the the profit motive for having people eat more fruit and vegetables have more broccoli and carrots and go for a walk every day there's not really big money to be made in that no one's going to get rich from people taking on board that advice so um it does save the health insurance companies some money and they have health promotion people and they're making more moves in this area i i see in australia but is still pretty small. Um, so there's, if you like, there's a, a financial and political inertia uh, maintaining the current status quo. Um, I'm sure some of the politicians know what needs to be done, but 
they're taking election money from these large vested interest groups, you know, the animal food industry, the processed food industry, the pharmaceutical industry. There's some trillion dollar industries and the broccoli or carrot industries don't have that kind of clout. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I, as you know, I interviewed some people in politics on my channel and just the way to make the shift, there's there's some people in there fighting the good fight, but for the vast majority, it's it's an uphill battle. So hmm. I guess if we want to shift it a little bit, what is the solution for all this? So you mentioned there's a three-week study you did, and then I guess at the macro level, like what is the solution to fix the healthcare system in your opinion? Well, it's, it's multifaceted. Um, the information about what makes people unwell and overweight is becoming more easy to find through documentaries, through social media, through news articles, through more books and recipe books in bookshops and word of mouth through family members. More and more people are figuring out that a plant-based diet ticks a lot of boxes. Um, it's better for their health. It's better for the environment. It's better for the animals. It reduces our pandemic risk. It can address the hunger of the 600 million people who are underfed still. Um, it ticks so many boxes. Um, so this is growing like topsy-turvy. I've been fully plant-based for 30 years and it was a, a very rare thing back then. And I had to explain to people what vegan was. I, I once was asked, was I a Trekkie? Um, someone, someone didn't, you know, was that confused. So things are changing fast, um, but people, are, it, it's still a tough journey for people even once they realize what to do because they, they, they can still be seduced by these pleasure trap foods, which are everywhere. Um, and people are becoming vegan, which is great. Um, but there, unlike when I started 30 years ago, there are vegan junk foods everywhere we turn. You can buy vegan ice creams, vegan chocolate, vegan donuts, you name it. Um, rich, salty, oily, vegan fake meats, um, vegan cheeses. These things are better for the environment and better for the animals and they're reducing the risk of pandemics through intensive animal agriculture, which is like a Petri dish for breeding more uh, pandemics. Um, so being, becoming vegan is a wonderful, huge step. Um, and it's still difficult because most people's friends and family aren't, but it's certainly a lot more common. Everybody knows someone who's got a vegan in the family now. Um, but the next step really is to eat healthy plant foods and, and minimize or avoid those rich, hyper-stimulating processed vegan foods and to eat what, what, I, what I call whole food plant-based, which is, is pretty much what it describes, eating whole plant foods um, and minimal, minimal processed foods. So, so there are people pushing on every front as, as you've explored in your YouTube channel to, to make societal change. And I think they all play valuable roles and we have to play to our strengths and our skills. Um, like I'm a, I'm a health practitioner, I've been, spent many years studying biology and the human condition as well as, as well as politics as a political activist. So I understand some of the dynamics of power and how to change things, but but I'm a health practitioner, so that's what I'm doing. Absolutely. And you mentioned there's like a, before our call, there's like a three-week study you did where you took blood samples before people went plant-based and after. Um, can you talk a little bit more about the results of that and what you found? Yeah, certainly. Um, this was something I'd been, I'd been trying to do for about a decade. I was aware that PCRM, Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine, had done such programs in the U.S., um, mm -hmm. And I was working in health promotion, community development type roles in local government for a number of years and, and working with some vulnerable populations. And I was trying to find a way to introduce a program like, like this where we could give people a chance to test out eating a super healthy diet for just a few weeks. So three weeks was chosen because it was 
we thought it was not too daunting, but was long enough to get significant change in biomarkers and people's well-being, objective and subjective. And, and an opportunity presented itself about 10 years down the track after, you know, tossing around and trying to get this sort of program up. And I jumped at it. And um, what we did was invite um, staff at a local government to participate and just put, put up posters and communicated via the workplace intranet and got a lot of interest. People were really curious. And so we offered them intensive wraparound support to go 100% whole food plant-based overnight from a designated start date. And we, we did subjective testing pre and post as well as um, biometric testing, weight, height, blood pressure, um, taking blood tests pre and post, working with a GP colleague. And um, we got tremendous results. In three weeks, we got an average 20% drop in total cholesterol and a 21% drop in LDL cholesterol, which is considered the significant and most dangerous measure. We got an average weight loss of three kilos in just three weeks. This was with over 80 people in five different programs. Um, so hugely effective. And the subjective changes were amazing. People said they felt better, they felt more productive, they had more energy, the mood improved, um, just amazing. And ripple effects with family members, you know, kids, when they took out the dairy, kids' acne disappeared, aches and pains in their joints disappeared, uh, migraines stopped. One, one woman had had migraines for years and they stopped completely once she adopted this. It was just incredibly rewarding to see these changes. And I surveyed these people 18 months to two years after they did the programs. And the, the rate of, of retention of these healthy behaviors is extraordinarily high. People, there's nothing as powerful as feeling good when you felt bad. And so the benefits they, they gain through feeling better far outweigh any sense of loss of not having bacon anymore or, or cheese, for example or chocolate on a nightly basis. So people were pretty keen to continue this stuff. And you know, so the reported retention was really high. So that was amazing experience. Um, yeah. That's amazing. And like, as you said, like more and more in social media, we're hearing the benefits of uh, whole food plant-based diets. And you're, you told me to interview someone who did a larger study in New Zealand. So I'm looking forward to connecting with him and getting on the channel. So um, one thing we kind of skipped over is your background and like what got you into this. So I know you're passionate about talking about that. Can you let us know how it started and your transition along the way and the work have you done? Yeah, sure. Um, well, I grew up in New Zealand. I was um, at your typical Western diet, lots of meat, dairy, eggs, vegetables. We had a garden, we grew fruit and veggies. So we did have a lot of those. My mum was a dietitian, So by those standards, it was a balanced diet. Um, but at the time, there was still a lot of cancer and heart disease was a leading killer. In fact, a lot of heart disease back then because people ate so much saturated fat from the animal heavy diet. New Zealand was a real, really huge producer of meat and dairy and still is. Um, and I even worked in shearing gangs when I was 16, 17, 18 over the summer holidays. And seven of us in a gang would eat a sheep per day. We worked 12 hour days, 5 a.m. to 5 p.m. And we would have a cooked breakfast at seven, a cooked lunch midday, a cooked dinner. And all of those had huge amounts of meat. And my job actually was to cut up the, the carcass, which was hanging in the shed. Uh, sometimes I'd have to carve off some parts where the flies had got to it, but we would eat one of those carcasses a day. Um, I, I became vegetarian through a partner I met my first serious girlfriend, and she was the first vegetarian I ever met that I knew of. I considered it kind of weird, but we were close. We moved in together and, uh, and we agreed to cook vegetarian in that house because it was just easier for the, all the people sharing in that household. And we had a great time trying out new recipes and I would still eat meat elsewhere out of home, but 12 months down the line, I gagged on a ham roll at university and thought, no, I'm done. I just, I stopped meat and fish from that point on 40 years ago. Um, and, 
And yet I had no idea about the health issues or the environmental issues or the ethical issues. I just didn't like it anymore from eating less at home. Um, the, the partner had never, never lectured or evangelized. She just did her thing quietly. And um, so I'm eternally grateful to her for steering me in that direction. But I started reading and devoured books at that point, like uh, Diet for a Small Planet by Francis Moore Lappe, which was really influential and uh, similar stuff. But it wasn't until a decade later that I found uh, John Robbins' amazing book, Diet for a New America. And he, it was the first time I'd seen all the arguments laid out for the health, the environment and the ethics. And that was a slam dunk for me. I just said, right, I'm going vegan. Um, and I moved to San Francisco not long after that. And that made it easy because there were quite a few vegans in the community that I lived with and hung out with. Um, so it, it, that made it easier. It's a, it's a harder thing to do on your own. And I salute those people who make that change on their own, but having community around you makes it a lot easier. Um, so as I said earlier, there, there weren't vegan junk foods around then. We couldn't even buy boxes of soy milk, which is not a junk food. I consider that a condiment that's okay, but we had to buy powder, um, make it up with water. It was pretty unpleasant. And it, I, it was, you couldn't find vegan chocolate or ice cream or anything like that back then. Um, but I became aware of whole food plant-based and shifted to that quite a few years ago because clearly um, I'm not getting any younger and I, I wanted to maximize my chances of staying healthy for a long time. So, yeah, and I, I have been an, uh, a scientist. I was a genetic engineer and did a postdoc in Montreal. Um, but that went a bit pear-shaped due to an um, unpleasant work environment, I'll say. I won't um, say any more, but I uh, detoured into about a decade of political activism, which was an amazing education um, and, and still informs how I think about the world today and, and the directions I take and strategies um, but I, eventually, I came back to Australia during that 10 years and did a master's in nutrition and dietetics um, and have continued to learn since then and uh, was awarded a fellowship in lifestyle medicine earlier this year, which was a, a great honour. Um, so, and been doing other courses and, you know, coaching, training and so forth like that so that I can help people better, really. Amazing. I'm learning in my career, like I'm not in the medicine side of things. I'm on nutrition, but like marketing, business, producing documentary, it's like continuous education. It's always learning and learning and learning. Mm -hmm. One of my first mentors said like, your real education starts after you get out of university, like read books, watch YouTube videos, mm -hmm. doing interviews like this. And it's funny you mentioned the, uh, the community, like when you moved to San Francisco, where having more people around you to support you, know, like that's how, that's what helped me go vegan in the first place where I went to potlucks. There's like maybe 20 or 30 vegans there every Saturday night. Mm. And just by being surrounded by that community, that's what brought it in. And as I'm filming this documentary, like there's the sociology side of things, the community, there's the psychology, there's nutrition, there's even the religion side of going vegan and all these different pieces playing together. So it's real interesting to see more stories like that. Then um, when it comes back to the shifting the healthcare system and what you're working with, what obstacles do you see, whether it's at the government level, the business level, or how do we make the most impact at, through the system changes? What obstacles do you see? Well, well, to begin with, just to set the scene, as I said earlier, I, I think what we have as a, a, you call a healthcare system is, is better known, better named as a sickness care system because it does a fabulous job if you get an infection or you have trauma, break a leg or something, They'll, they'll patch you up and get you well again and get you home. But if you have chronic disease, which is what most people in hospital have, it, they generally don't get you well. They'll say, well, you have type 2 diabetes, you have to take metformin, you'll be on this for life, or you have heart disease, you need statins to keep your cholesterol down, you need blood pressure meds. That's the, the modus operandi of the system. It's It's... Dean Ornish uses the analogy of a sink overflowing and the doctors are mopping the floor frantically, but they're not looking behind them to turn off the tap. 
And, and our sickness care system is pretty much like that. It's, it's treating symptoms with pills and procedures, but it's not addressing the upstream determinants, which is why lifestyle medicine is the way of the future, because it's focused on causes and looking at, okay, why has this person become unwell or overweight? What can we do to address the way they're living and support that person through education and empowerment to change direction and take control of their life and their health? Um, and it's very empowering because in contrast to the, the so-called healthcare system, which is quite disempowering, you, you're a passive recipient and people in white coats who treat you, you know, they, they might talk over you, they might, they might treat you as a human and talk to you, but your, your control of the decisions is minimal. You're, you're told you, you have diabetes, you need this medication, or your arteries blocked, you're going to need a stent or a bypass. That's quite disempowering, as, especially if you're not told that there's any alternative, which generally you're not. Um, and that's what motivates and drives me and upsets me because people, people have a right to know that there's another route, that they don't have to have these potentially harmful medications or procedures that have risks and downsides. Like, like a, a drug never does just one thing. There are, there are always ripple effects and side effects. Um, and it's not getting the person well. Like, like diabetes is not caused by a metformin deficiency. Um, high cholesterol is not caused by a statin deficiency. These things are lifestyle induced. So it just makes so much sense to, to address the lifestyle. Um, so the, the barriers that you ask about are multiple. Um, doctors are not taught nutrition at medical school and dietitians are not generally taught about plant-based nutrition to any extent or at all. I certainly wasn't. I was, I was a, a vegan when I went and studied my master's in nutrition, but I was one of two in the whole class. Um, and so that's a barrier because the practitioners who people are, are going to, in many cases, are not aware of these, these um, solutions to illness and haven't seen the power of, of a plant-based lifestyle and other positive lifestyle measures. They haven't, doctors haven't, ever had to deprescribe medicines. They're not taught deprescribing. Um, so this is challenging to people. And medical professionals are highly esteemed people who are looked up to. It's a very high status job, and even more so if you're a specialist. So it's, a, it's kind of a, a swallowing the pride situation for people to go, I did all this training, and I've been in practice for 10, 20 years. And now I have to realize I was wrong and I could have helped these people. I mean, that's, that's, that could be a very humbling um, change of position for many people. I can understand that they might not be open to going there. You know, we have confirmation bias. Um, and, and so there's, there's inertia in the system, but I think the change is coming from below. Um, like I was recently privileged to be invited to speak at a medical student annual conference here in Melbourne uh, and by an organizer who was whole food plant-based. So um, it's, it's a generational shift is happening and more and more people are becoming aware of this. And it's, it's kind of like the old saying, all, all roads point to Rome, all roads lead to Rome. Um, any angle you look at it, you know, the environmental reports are more and more suggesting we need to eat less animal food. The, the information is becoming harder to ignore around the health changes. And more and more doctors are seeing patients who find the stuff and get well. The patients may look, go online and look up, how can I reverse my diabetes and find a plant-based dietitian or doctor? And then they might go back to their normal GP. And the, if the GP is curious, they'll go, what did you do? How did you do that? Um, some of them are not curious. They'll say, look, that's a miracle, or I don't, I don't care what you did, but keep doing it. Um, and that's pretty sad. But in, in some ways, you could argue that 
practitioners have a duty of care to, to offer people a known treatment. And in most cases today, that's not being offered because the practitioner, for whatever reason, isn't aware that that's a treatment or they might have heard of it and discounted it. Um, but as the, as the weight of evidence of more and more people changing their lives and getting well becomes more apparent um, and more and more research is published showing the power of this. Um, you mentioned my friend and colleague, Luke Wilson, who had a powerful study published, um, the broad study with the population in, in Gisborne, New Zealand, who had lots of obesity and diabetes and heart disease, and they got incredible results. So things like that are starting to make waves. Um, the, the truth is a stubborn thing, if you like. It's, it's inevitable that this is going to make its way more and more into, into broader professional and public consciousness. So I hope that it accelerates and it is, it is seemingly accelerating from what I can tell. Um, but the other barrier that, that is holding things back is reimbursement. And as, as Dean Ornish has, has rightly observed, um, reimbursement determines practice. And if something can't be reimbursed, then it's very hard to, to offer that as a service because at the moment, doctors are remunerated for short sessions and generally that involves a prescription or referral to a specialist, which might involve more prescriptions and maybe procedures. Um, but the kind of lifestyle intervention that's needed takes more time. And, and our consultation is just the beginning. Um, often it takes you know, dozens of hours of, of working with a person to help um, help them adopt a new lifestyle and all the habits and skills needed, the knowledge, et cetera. So it's, it's a valuable investment. Like um, we, we have a lifestyle medicine program coming up, which, which is going to be all online. So it's a bit cheaper, but we can offer that at a bit under a thousand dollars per person. And we can divert um, people who are very sick in, through that program from the need for uh, cardiac bypass surgery, for example, which might cost over $50,000 and is not without significant risks. Um, and if the person doesn't change their lifestyle, those bypassed vessels replaced in the heart can also block up, as will stents. So it's not even a, a, a long-term fix. And, and in fact, the research shows that stents have no impact on on survival rate and, and length of survival post the, uh, the stent. Um, so, so what we can do is more time intensive, but because we can do it in groups, which adds the extra power of peer support, which we talked about earlier, but it means it's a whole lot more cost effective. So again, I see it as a no brainer that things will shift this way eventually, but we still need to persuade the different levels of government that this is something that we should be funded. Um, I'm, I deeply believe that healthcare is a human right uh, along like, alongside housing and education um, and, and that it shouldn't be a commodity as it is in the US largely. So although the programs we're setting up and delivering are uh, uh, fee for service at the moment. It's be only because we have to pay for our time. We're not doing this to get rich. Um, but I see this inevitably as something that will be publicly funded and, and therefore available to people who may not be able to afford our programs at the moment. And that, that saddens me that there are people who would benefit from this, but who, who won't have the, the money or perhaps even the time to do this. Um, Health, some health insurance companies and workplaces in the US are actually funding their staff to do immersion retreats or to go to places like True North Health Center um, because they see that sending a, a staff member who's overweight and or unwell on a seven day immersion retreat, for example, which might cost five or 6,000 or more in the US is a really valuable investment because the, 
in the US where the workplace pays the health insurance premiums, that can be a massive saving to that employer. So there's, there's slightly different dynamics and drivers in the US system. Um, employers here don't pay healthcare costs for, for staff, although they do pay the price of reduced productivity. And there's an Australian study which shows that the healthiest employees in a workplace can be up to 300% more productive than the least healthy. So that was, the, that was a pitch we made in the local government where I ran these programs. Um, it was all based around productivity. And, and that's a serious argument. Employers should take note because there's a lot of um, lost time through absenteeism and even presenteeism through people who are functioning way below their, their, their optimum capacity just because they're unwell. Um, we know in Australia that almost every working age adult has multiple risk factors for chronic disease if they don't already have chronic disease. So the, and the, the employers that support staff in this way are also going to benefit from increased engagement and loyalty, um, potentially a lot less staff turnover, um, also attracting the best and brightest because they, they, they're demonstrating they really take employee health seriously. So there are some drivers for change, but until we can get state or federal funding of programs like these, then it's going to be challenging to make it pay. Um, and we're, we're cutting the cost of our programs that I'm running with colleagues as low as we can. Um, but it, it's still challenging to make these things run cost effectively. And, and yeah, anyway, more questions? <laughs> Absolutely. Um, maybe a little bit more about where people would find your programs, but you mentioned one thing, I guess, earlier where it's like the, my Emma Hurst interview, she's an MP in the government in New South Wales in Sydney, Australia. And during my interview with her, she said like change happens at the individual level in terms of veganism. There's a streak to activists, the cubes of truth, then the businesses pick up. So they create more plant-based things based on demand. And then it's not until later down the road when the businesses and the individuals like enough people change before people like her and government could really make change and mm. like, because the constituents aren't aware of it. So it seems like based on what we talked about before, where there's the individuals waking up, being aware, then businesses and clinics and doctors and organizations like yours making the change here. And it's like the government comes next and it's not really, the uh, we don't want to rely on them to make the change for us. So that's a really big takeaway I got from all my interviews here. Do you want to expand more um, about, I guess, your specific programs, where people can find you and more stuff like that? Yeah, sure. Um, and, and I think you've summed it up correctly in terms of the, the change process. I think it's always much more powerful when change comes from below, from the community. Uh, I don't think we can expect governments to lead on this. They're, they're too beholden to the status quo and the, the very big cashed up industries as discussed earlier, the animal ag, um, pharmaceutical industries, et cetera. Um, even our, our peak medical bodies have got a lot of power. And, and as Dr. Michael Greger has um, mentioned in his talks, uh, the American Medical Association opposed the, the first um, director general's warning against smoking when it first came out, but they were shown at the time to be taking large donations from the tobacco industry. So yeah, there's, there's, government is not gonna be the first to lead on this, but they will sniff the wind and see if there's change coming from below. Um, but I, I, I subscribe to the thinking of people like John Dewey, who said government is the shadow cast by big business. It's not where the real power's at. The, the power is these trillion dollar corporations who can, who can generally make or break governments. And we've seen that in Australia when government tried to increase royalties on mining, for example, or change laws around our gambling businesses. And in both cases, the government ran away with its tail between its legs after getting a, a hiding from these industries. Um, 
it really shows where the power is. So we have to keep building change from below. Um, but governments understand economics as well. Like if we can put it to them that we can deliver a program like this for 1,000 or 3,000 or 4,000 compared to $50,000 for a bypass and ongoing huge costs, then that's, that's a no brainer for, for economists. Um, so the programs that my colleagues and I are offering, I'm working with um, my friends and colleagues, Dr. Malcolm Mackay, a, Malcolm, a Melbourne plant-based GP and his partner, Jenny Cameron, who's a nutritionist and health coach. We are offering a 10 week um, lifestyle medicine programs to, to give people support in all the domains of health to get well and to take control of their health and to empower them. So that includes nutrition, obviously, but support around exercise, sleep, substance use, um, stress management, um, social connection, purpose, things like that. So all the, all the key domains of, of health and well-being. And we have a parallel program, which is a compressed version. So people can either take the 10 week program at, at three or four hours a week, or they can do an intensive seven day immersion program. And the next one is late November um, out in the beautiful Yarra Valley. And that includes the same content as the 10 week course, but compressed. So cooking classes, nutrition classes, gen walks in the bush, yoga, meditation, stress reduction, et cetera, education around getting good sleep, managing your stress, managing substance use, et cetera. Um, Complementing those, we offer webinars and seminars, e-newsletters, um, individual consultations with ourselves or the other practitioners we're working with, the exercise teacher, the, the yoga teacher, the cooking instructor, um, all, all of the people can get individual consultations in addition. We're also offering the workplace health programs. Um, so it's we're aiming it as a suite of options to suit any person with, with their time and their budget as much as possible. As I said earlier, it, it would be ideal if these things were all supported by the government and were, were publicly funded and at no cost. Um, but unfortunately we have to cover our costs and so there there is a fee for these but we're basically wanting to get runs on the board we will gather more data as we go and have more of a, a powerful case to present to to governments to say this is working this is something you should fund and we, we also aim to gather data to get research publications um, all of us are in private practice as well. Um, so we're seeing this on a one-to-one -one basis, the, the power of these changes that, that these things can make. Um, I've helped people reverse diabetes. I've helped people reverse rheumatoid arthritis, sinusitis, all kinds of chronic conditions. People have got relief from pain and suffering and got well. Um, I had a, a patient email me a couple of weeks ago saying, I first saw him in mid-September last year. So what about nine months ago? He said he, he and his wife had each lost 35 kilos and were feeling fantastic. And he sent me before and after photos. And uh, he now looks like a normal, healthy person with a normal weight. So amazing. It, it's just incredibly rewarding doing this work um, because it, it's people get so well and it just changes their life. Um, and it, it makes me just really sad to see people essentially sleepwalking to a, a later life of sickness and, and pain and, and potential surgeries and potentially a shorter life, not knowing what they don't know. Um, so it really is powerful helping spread this this message that people can, can take, take control of their health and not have to suffer with the burden of chronic disease and obesity. Um, 
it's so fulfilling. <clears throat> um, yeah, anyway. Yeah, it sounds like amazing work that you do where just when you described right there, that sums everything up where I just picture like people to go in, they could go to a seven day retreat. It's kind of like a vacation. They surround themselves with positive people. They could enjoy, learn new things and come out transformed. And I still, from my experience, like it's like the three week window or like a one week window when you put yourself in a new environment, it kind of like shatters your reality, breaks you out of your habits, and then mm -hmm. you're on your way to keep going up from there. So what's your website where people could go to find more information about this? Um, we have a, a new website just launching today, in fact, um, called um, melbournelifestylemedicine.com.au. So you can find us there and the suite of programs um, and information, much more detail about what the programs are and detail about us, how to contact us, et cetera. 